In this episode, we dive into victim consciousness. This may be a trigger for some, and we are willing to have the difficult conversations to promote healing so you can live an abundant and fulfilling life. Welcome to the Abundant Hack Show, where we are inspiring you to tap into your power to manifest the happiness, success, and fulfillment that you desire. I am your host, Niaje, the Upper Limit Coach. I am here to dismantle your limiting beliefs and remove the blocks so you can confidently live your life's purpose, because life is meant to be abundant. Hey, m ms Thank you for tuning in to the Abundance Hack Show. What are you manifesting in your life today? I am super excited about today's guest. It's Allison Donaghy, and we have actually chatted before. I was on her podcast, Domino Thinking, and it was called Permission to Shine. So I will definitely put the link to that in the show notes so you can check out my interview. So before we dive into who she is and what she does, Allison, I want to ask you, what does abundance mean to you? Oh, abundance, I think, is just having that peace that you have what you need. And it's going to look like different things to different people. Like some people, abundance is having no mortgage. To other people, it's having 15 properties. And so I think it's getting really clear on where is your really secure space. And that would be how I would define the, uh, that abundance because it is so different. Mm, yeah, it's so true. <laughs> yeah. So... I know that you are a complete rock star and you are passionate about not letting people define who they are, but I want to know a little bit more of your backstory. So who is Allison Donaghy? Oh gosh, where to begin? This is always such a hard question, right? Um, so I, I live on the West coast of Canada and I, I, I often start my story with depending on the, the audience about because the work I do now goes back to when I was sexually assaulted in high school. And, and it took me a really long time to get to that place where I understood how I co-created the construction of that without the shame or the blame or any of those things. But knowing that I played a role in it, it took me about 15 years to figure that out. But as soon as I did, I stopped being his victim. And mm. so I talk about that importance of owning stuff to understanding your, where your worth comes from. And, and I always think when we look back at those experiences that we had, those horrible traumatic things that we like, why did it happen to me? I think it happens to us so that we can help other people get through it or avoid having it happen altogether. Mm. Yeah. Which might be more than what you intended to ask for that opening sentence. <laughs> No, no, we, we like to get, we like to get deep here. So well, I figured just dive in, right? Okay. So a lot of people would consider that like victim shaming. So we're, we're going to get mm -hmm. into victim shaming before we get into that. How did you transition from this, this traumatic thing happening to you to now coaching, you know, and, and having your podcast, helping people overcome that victim mm -hmm. mindset? Yeah, well, I think one of the other big things that happened to me is during this messy time while I was still trying to navigate the waters of that experience, I ended up meeting a guy who taught me how to paint. And then I moved in with him and he relapsed into drug addiction. So it was six years of dealing with somebody's drug addiction. And then when he passed away, I thought, oh gosh, what am I going to do? I'm a single mom on welfare and I'm not quite sure retail's not going to cut it. So I started a house painting company and I still have it, but all that empowering steps that you take that, uh, oh, I have value. Oh, I can do this. Oh, look what I accomplished, right? All of that stuff really builds our core of how we see ourselves. I remember one time I was at a gas station and there was, I'm in my paint clothes. And so you can only imagine, I was not looking attractive at the moment. I had my old paint van and she was all beat up. We called her Betsy and, you know, and I just felt like a mess and I wasn't feeling very successful that day. And this woman pulled up in front of me at the pump in this cute little sports car and she gets out and she's beautiful and she's all done up well. And I'm feeling a little bit ashamed of myself given the comparison and then I thought, oh, wait a second, I hire people, I give people jobs. And I started feeling better about who I was without taking anything away about with from her being fantastic. And then she walked by me and she's like, hey, is this your company? And I said, yeah. And she goes, good for you, way to go, which is not who I expected her to be. So there's just so many learning opportunities in that. And so the more I have those experiences, the more I paid attention to them, then moved me into creating domino thinking and dealing with worthiness. 
Mm, so powerful. Yeah. Comparison is a huge, huge part of it. So mm. how, how would you say, cause I, I feel like I've had this conversation with someone about, about topics, sensitive topics like, you know, sexual assault or abuse. And there's a lot of people that say it's never your fault. It's never your fault. So saying like, okay, I had a part in this. How would you say, like, like how, just speak to that. Cause I, I don't know the verbiage to not offend people. Cause I feel like when it comes to trauma, mm -hmm. there's a lot of sensitivity around it. Absolutely. And as I say, it took me 15 years to get through that, right? So this isn't something I had happened. And the next day I was like, oh, I created this, my fault. You know, when I talk about this, it's never about shame or blame or letting anybody off for any bad behavior. But what it is, is that when we are engaging with somebody else, it's a dance that we are choosing to participate in on some level. So if you look at my situation, I was in high school, I had zero self-esteem, I had no sense of worth at all. I had just moved to across the country to a new school, horrible to have happened as a teenager. And this girl said to me, hey, do you wanna to come to my youth group? And my first thought was, hell no, I don't wanna to go to youth group. Like I've tried that religion thing, it's not my, my jam. I just, other people, great, I have no problem with it, it just wasn't good for me. And then I heard myself saying, yes, I'd love to go, thank you. And I'm having this argument in my head about, no, I don't want to go, but yes, I want to go, but no, I don't want to go. Friday night comes, we go, and there's a guy there, and he has all these girls around him, and he's really cute, and, and he saw me, and he immediately came over and started talking to me, and I'm like, oh my God, he wants to talk to me? And so shortly into the conversation, I realized I didn't really like him as a human being. And he said, oh, hey, do you want to go out sometime? And in my head, I'm like, no, I don't want to go out with you. And out of my mouth came, sure, I'd love to go out with you. Because I just didn't want to offend anybody. I didn't mm. want to um, have anybody else say anything else bad about me. There was enough bad things being said. And so the whole experience was me knowing I didn't want to do something. And I still went ahead with it anyway. Mm. And so I agreed cosmically however you want to look at it to be part of that situation did i choose to get raped no like is it okay that he did it no and i cannot emphasize that enough but it wasn't until i understood it was a series of my choices that landed me in that place was i able to stop being his victim mm. and when i've talked to other people about it they go through this process they can get to that same place and I no longer am being owned by him or that experience. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it was a lot of people pleasing and doing things that your inner being was saying no, but you, you didn't listen. So trusting your intuition more. Yeah. Which mm. has nothing to do with deserving to get raped. It yeah. has nothing to do with blaming the victim. It has to do with me saying every experience I have, I participate in the construction of it. Mm -hmm. So I get to either choose to contribute in a healthy way that's good for me and walk away from those experiences that aren't, or I end up in more of those types of situations. Mm, I feel like that is a really hard pill for some people to swallow. It is. And I apologize to y'all out there who are frustrated and twitching a little bit right now and squirming because it's not a popular point of view. But there is this place of neutrality that if you can get to it, where you are just able to see it. If somebody saw my experience in a movie, they would be able to see how I contributed to it. And at no point would they say she deserved it. But it would just be like, oh, why didn't she just say no there? Why didn't she just see herself as being prettier than she thought or more valuable than she thought or more worthy than she thought? We can look at that when it's happening out there and dissect it. When it happens to us, it is so hard to separate the emotions, the shame, the blame, the guilt, all of that from the construction of it. Yeah. So how would you say someone can take trauma and turn it into, I don't want to say triumph because it sounds, I don't want it to sound cliche, but like really regain their power and their strength and their worthiness after trauma? I think it comes down to being really kind and gentle to yourself and practice with small things first. 
I didn't just dive into this problem and go, I'm going to practice on this, right? I started looking at other people's situations and started saying, okay, how did they construct this? How did all of those people create this situation? And when you watch people, two people arguing, you can see how they're both adding to that energy. So I would watch people interact and I'd go, oh, she's leaning forward. He's leaning back. That's what this means. This is how, this is their dance. And then I started working on it with some of my smaller issues, like um, my attitude in traffic, right? How am I contributing to that rage that I'm feeling when I'm driving or the irritation or any of those kind of things? So smaller things where it's it's not touching the core of my being and shattering me. And the better we get with those things, the more we can look at other situations and do the same. So now I'm at a place in my life where everything that happens, I go, okay, I co-created that somehow. Now what? Like, so what now what? Like, how do I move on from this? Mm, I love it. I love it. I think that self-awareness is extremely powerful and, and being aware of our thoughts and our energy and the things that we are doing that's drawing situations to us. It's really powerful. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this also isn't about letting him off the hook. I could have tracked him down. I could have had him charged all these years later. I chose that wasn't the right path for me. I just wanted to get on with my life at that point. For other people, it might be part of their process to have that process, right? So this, please, like, I hope anybody listening here is not saying it's okay that people have done bad things. It's never okay. How we deal with it becomes our choice, though. Mm. And how would you say, like, forgiveness plays a part in that? Um, uh, forgiveness is a complicated topic, I think, because often forgiveness has nothing to do with the other person. It actually is about forgiving ourselves, right? So in that situation, I had to forgive that part of me that had no self-esteem. And in doing so, I actually built my internal worth. Right, because my experience with all of that, me carrying it on for 15 years, me talking about it now, really has very little to do with him, forgiving him, seeing him, any of that. It has to do with how I want to show up in the world. And so um, when we're able to forgive ourselves, and that is, everything's a double-edged sword it's in my head all the time. It's not about giving yourself permission to have behaved poorly as well and to continue to behave poorly. Like, oh, I was just really mean to her and that's okay. I forgive myself for being mean to her because she deserved it anyway. Mm. That's not really forgiveness. Right? We are using that word to justify more poor behavior. Mm. Forgiveness is truly getting to that point where you can find peace. And the peace is always for you. It's never for them. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And you said internal worth. So for someone, because I, I do think this is my personal belief, worth is at an all time low right now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So how can someone build their internal worth? Okay. So we can back up just a wee bit. I want to say there's two ways we get our worth internally and externally. Internally is knowing that we're, we're okay. That regardless of what ha is happening out there, we're fine. If somebody says something nasty to me, I'm still okay. I don't have to jump on that train. And because we are born miraculous, we inherently have internal worth. So I'm not asking people to look for something that doesn't already exist. I'm asking people to reclaim what's already theirs. Right? We never look at a little baby and go, oh, no, not a miracle. <laughs> Like how absurd would that be to, to think or say, um, we look at babies and we think, whoa, like a sperm and an egg and you <laughs> like goosebumps. It's incredible. It's amazing. It's beautiful, which makes that little critter inherently worthy. And so then we're born into the world and the world tells us we're not good enough, or at least that is how we internalize it. And somebody says, why can't you be more like your sister? How come you can't be better at sports? Why do you have to read all the time? Why can't you sit still? 
right? Then they have the media saying, why aren't you prettier? Why aren't you taller? Why aren't you thinner? Why aren't you like, where's your six pack, right? We have all of that stuff. Oh, you're not going to be successful until you own those 15 properties, right? Because this is what abundance should mean to you. Right. And, and then we think, oh, but abundance to me is having chickens in the backyard. Like that's cool for me, but we feel less than because that's not what is being portrayed as having abundance or being a value. So when we're looking at worth, and I believe it's the foundation of every single choice we make, we are either getting our worth from somebody else externally, or we're figuring it out ourselves. The more we can rely on ourselves, the more we can hold ourselves responsible for the choices that we make, the stronger our internal worth gets. Because we get to have that conversation with those parts in our head that are making or saying or doing maybe bad things, right? So we're abrupt with our child and we're like, whoa, what was going on there? And we say to our child, I am really sorry. I was really super rude to you. I, like, there was no reason for that that boosts our internal worth, right? Because we are seeing that part of ourselves, acknowledging it and taking responsibility for it. When we are trying to get our worth externally, which is what we're seeing all over the place today, is if you do and say what I want you to, now I have worth because that makes me more right and therefore I'm more valuable. If you don't do what I think you should do, I can say really nasty things to you. And I'm going to feel powerful because I'm putting you down. Now I feel worthy. But that worthy is temporary and it requires somebody else's involvement for it to have happen. And it, it, it's not sustainable. Yeah. And there's so much of that on social media and so many people searching for worth on social media, how many likes and how many comments and stuff like that. So yeah, I, I think that right now it's a very a very sensitive thing, especially with everything that's going on in a world. Have you ever thought, who am I to write a book, start a podcast, or create an online course? Have you ever been hesitant to share your gifts with the world because you were afraid of what people would say or think? It is time to stop hiding your magic from the world. Go to niage.com forward slash decadent to download the six steps to a decadent you so you can gain clarity around your purpose, have courage to stand in your truth, build confidence to step into your power and shine your light bright unapologetically. Go to niage.com forward slash decadent so you can take the steps towards thriving in your fullest expression. I think that in, in, from my perspective, self-worth starts a lot with our parents. You know, did our parents give us the words of affirmation we needed? Did they tell us we were pretty or, or handsome if it's a, you know, a male? And throughout life, we're constantly seeking that external validation if we didn't receive it as children. But I think doing inner child work is really powerful, loving that part of you that didn't receive the validation or words of affirmation that they were seeking in their childhood. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's always coming back to that place of seeing that we belong here, we have value here, we have a place in, our wor in this world, which means we are of value. And, and sometimes it's not about our parents trying to be awful to us. You know, saying to your child, you know, I know you can do better than this. What's going on? Right? A child could go, oh, I'm never doing anything good enough for my parents. When that wasn't even the intent of what the parent was saying. So it doesn't even, sometimes it has to do with the other people if they're always berating you in that, because there's definitely really harmful ways of saying and doing things. But a sentence like, honey, I know you can do better. This is about seeing, um, potential in somebody and asking them to stretch. When we are on the receiving end of that on some random Tuesday and we're not having a good morning, we see that as rude and insulting and saying we're not good enough. And so, and when we're younger, we don't have much say over that stuff, right? We are at the mercy of what is happening out there. But as we get older, at some point, if we don't take responsibility, somebody else will always own our happiness. So true. So you brought up something that that made me think, I know like I'm someone, I feel like 
part of my purpose in this world is to help people be the best versions of themselves, show them there's more, there's more excitement, there's more passion, there's more love, there's more success, there's more abundance. Like abundance is like my thing, but I know that there are people that I've tried to build up in my life and they took it as I didn't accept them for who they were and I was putting them down. So me saying like, you deserve more than this or you can do better, have better, be better. They took that as well, you don't accept me and you're putting me down or you're trying to change me. Yeah. So the way my brain works, it, it didn't register in my head how they could see that or like how they could feel that way when I'm like, it's quite the opposite. I'm trying to build you up. So can you speak to that a little? Mm -hmm. Sometimes people aren't ready to grow, mm. right? And sometimes we use language without even knowing that somebody in their past used so it has nothing to do with what we are saying to them in the moment. It has to do with all of that stuff that they haven't dealt with that somebody said to them in their past. And so there's definitely that. The other thing too, and I'm sure you do this, but checking in to see what more looks like to them, mm. right? Because there are times and I'm, I'm guilty of it where I'm just like, just do this and you'll be great. Right. And then if I take the time, they're like, but, that's not how I want to live. And in some cases, it's because they're afraid to step into that reality. And in other cases, they just want chickens in the backyard. <laughs> right? And um, who was it? The woman that wrote Eat, Pray, Love. Mm. And she, there was an article about her and she had given this big speech about, you know, living big and all of that. And a woman came up to her at the end and said, you know what? I'm a little bit offended because my big is not the same as your big. And yet you don't speak to my garden and how much that matters to me. And it seems like nothing to you. And it was Melissa Gilbert, right? Is that her name? Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's always checking in and making sure that your dreams for somebody are their dreams for themselves is sort of that first spot. And then finding out wh where the resistance is coming from. Yes. I love it. So powerful. So I think that's a really great segue into, you know, what you do as far as not letting people decide who you are. So what are some steps for, because I think people need clarity of like what their dreams even are, because a lot of times what we think we want is, is covered in so many layers of fear and doubt and scarcity. So how can someone really tap into who they are or who they want to be without those layers of crap that society mm -hmm. piled on them? Yeah. Uh, I'm a big fan of keeping track of what makes you feel good and what doesn't make you feel good. Right. And so have it on your phone and you're pumping gas and you're like, damn, I love pumping gas. Right. But I really hate going inside and paying that really brings my energy down or start tracking what feels good without judgment, without thinking, without filtering any of those kind of things. If something just feels good, do more of it. But first, you have to know the differences between what feels good, what is responsibility, what has to be done, but you don't necessarily like it, because maybe you'll get to a point where you can farm that stuff out to somebody else to do. Um, and I also have a system. It's a free system on my website. It's called Brave. It's a five-step five step system. And the first step is to breathe. And so this is a way of figuring out if we are reacting to a situation or responding. So reacting is just that instant um, blurting out of the things that we do. Responding is taking a moment and going, how do I want to be in this moment? So the first step is to breathe. So when something happens, it, we're sort of in a shock for about four to seven seconds. So somebody cuts you off at traffic and you go, oh, that lasts about four to seven seconds, that feeling tight feeling in your chest. Somebody says something mean to you and you go, oh, ow, right? That lasts four to seven seconds. If you can breathe through that to like 10 or 20 seconds, you are now at choice. If you don't, you enter into story after those four to seven seconds. So somebody cuts you off in traffic and you're like, oh my God, you know what? That person is probably such a jerk. I bet they beat their spouse. And you know what? There was that guy last week who did the same thing to me. Why does this always happen? Why does this always happen to me? Right? And we get into this big story. It is no longer about this person that cut you off in traffic. It is about all of that other crap that you're not dealing with. But if you breathe for those four to seven seconds 
and really breathe. Don't breathe so that you're fueling that flame. <laughs> breathe so that you are separating from that experience. A really brilliant friend of mine, you actually might know her, Amy. I think we met her at the New Media Summit. And she says, focus under your feet when you're breathing. So if you put your feet on the ground and you focus on that space between your feet and the ground, you can't think about anything else. Keeps it really clear. So you breathe through that experience. Now you're at choice. Now you get to decide who you are going to be. And then you can always go and download the other four steps. But that is sort of that key one. And it separates you from that emotion, that reaction. I love it. I love it. I will definitely have the link for that in the show notes so people can go listen because I think that's really, really powerful. Really Mm -hmm. powerful. Okay. So what are your top three tips for living an abundant life? Oh, first, don't let other people decide who you are. (laughs) If you want to have the chickens in the backyard or the 15 properties, know what it is that you want and you get to decide who you are. The second one I think is don't let other people own your happiness, right? When we give our worth away to somebody else, we are putting our happiness in their hands because if they respond the way we want them to, then we'll be happy. I want you to be happy regardless of what they're doing. And then the third one, oh man, Um, usually most hosts are like one, but you just give so much more value. So I have to really think about this one. Um, Be kind to yourself, right? I think we get on this fast track. We get on this treadmill where we're going, going, going so we can have all this stuff. And we forget that we are the most important person in our own story and we need to take care of ourselves because there's no point getting to the finish line with a heart attack. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I am a huge, huge advocate for self-care and as entrepreneurs, especially being so busy, we lose sight of that so often. So I'm always reminding others and myself, self-care is number one. You can't pour from an empty cup. So yeah. 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 And I think, and I encourage people to really explore what self-care means Mm -hmm. because it can enter into external worth if we're not careful. Mm. Right. So my self-care is I'm going to get my nails done, my self-care so that other people will think I look good. Mm. Self-care should never be about pleasing somebody else or getting a reaction from somebody else. Mm -hmm. Right. It always has to be with that refueling. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I see it more of like getting the proper amount of sleep, grounding, hydrating, you know, eating nutritional food and and stuff like that. So, I mean, I feel like nails and hair, that's just a bonus. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Totally do it, but know why you're doing it, right? All of that stuff that you just listed, nobody else in the world needs to know about, Mm -hmm. right? But it keeps you centered. It keeps you grounded. It keeps you in this really good, healthy space. And that is so beautiful. That's such a great example because that has nothing to do with anybody out there. So that is like internal worth at its finest. Yes. <laughs> yeah, good job, you. Yeah. <laughs> so, so what's next for you? Oh gosh, I'm not sure. Mm. You know, I'm really enjoying, I think I'm, I'm going to try to blend my life a little bit more because mm. I feel like I've got different pods of what I do. And I think ultimately it's about how do we just find happiness in our life? And so my son is taking over my painting company. And so I'm doing less and less with that all the time, but I have designed a color selection system that helps people understand and pick their own colors so that they're not relying on other people to tell them what they like. I love it. (laughs) Right. And I've written a business book. And so I, you know, probably do a little bit more of a program around that. And then of course, always the worthiness stuff, because if that's not intact, we're not going to be successful at things. So that is definitely the underlying thing for all the things. Yeah. Thank you so much. And I I love everything that you're doing. Congrats on your son taking over your paint business. That's huge. Yeah, it is really, it's been happening for a little while, but it's really a slow process because I I don't want to set him up to fail, right? There's so much to learn. Mm -hmm. And it's not the same as when I started it. I started it with like a clunky old van and one tray and one brush and roller. We have an entire system now and we've just opened another branch. So it's far more Mm -hmm. complicated. And he's great. He's, I feel so fortunate 
Oh, met. that's amazing. And not only I get to work with him, I like him, we travel, like, so it's, it's great. Yeah. <laughs> I love that you said that. You don't hear, you really don't hear parents often say, like, I like my kids. Yeah. <laughs> I love that you said that. <laughs> I do. I feel so fortunate. I think part of it is I was a young mom. And so it was just him and me for so long. And for most of it, I guess. And uh, so we got to be close, right? Yeah. yeah I love but, it. I love it. Yeah, I'm lucky. Yeah. So keep doing the worthiness piece. I think it is so important, so crucial, especially these days that people really understand their worth and not tie it to the external things, the house, the car, the, you know, sexy partner or whatever. Like we have that internal worth, that internal peace. It's so important. So I love everything you're doing. Yeah. Thank you so much. And I want to say too, it's not a destination. It's a journey because we're complicated and we have layers. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to get in the space where we're feeling really good about things. And then something's going to happen. You're like, I have no worth. And then you <laughs> figure that out. Right. And you move out. So it's this journey. And so enjoy every step of it. Yeah. So yeah. true. So true. I remember, so I, the, the woman I sold my studio to basically ran the business into the ground and I tied so much of my worth to like, oh, I have this thriving business. And then when it wasn't around anymore, I'm like, who am I? Like, you know, so yeah. it's really important, even when it comes to like marriages, like a lot of times people lose themselves when they go through a divorce, because that was so much of their identity. So mm -hmm. it's a, it's a, like you said, it's a journey and it's a never ending process because life will happen. Things will challenge you, but the more you sharpen that internal piece, the better you're going to be able to deal with the challenges that life throw at you. Well, and when we own it too, like you saying my worth was tied up in that business, mm -hmm. you're owning that part of yourself. Right. And when you own that, it's really hard to be a victim and own it at the same time, right? So when you say, I sold the business, I did that. Mm -hmm. It takes that victimization out of it a little bit. Like it takes that sting away. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so powerful. I just got chills. <laughs> <laughs> well, we could talk about this all day, but I have to wrap this up. Thank you so much for coming. And again, I love everything you're doing. I will have all her notes in the show, in the show notes, all her links in the show notes. So you can definitely check her out, check out her podcast because it's phenomenal. And until next time, be decadent. Thank you for tuning in to the Abundant Hack Show. I would love to hear from you. Leave your comments and questions and don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any of our yummy episodes. Every time you leave a five-star rating or review, I do my happy dance. <laughs>